Hello and a very good afternoon. Welcome back to the very first day of the very first World Skills UK Live Online International Skills Summit. My name is Simon Lederman. I'm going to be your host for the next couple of days. You have um, missed a remarkable set of discussions so far in the company of Anne Milton and Robert Halfen and also uh, the Minister Gillian Keegan. That will be available for you to view after the event, but we will of course be discussing many of those points that have been raised so far during today and the next day. And if you have at any point got any questions or queries or perhaps areas of your own expertise that you'd like to put forward, we can debate it amongst all of our discussions uh, today and tomorrow. You can do so by filling in the questionnaire on the right hand side of the screen. It involves just putting your name and your job title and your question and we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. However, this next item is an event that we pre-recorded last week. So please don't put your questions in for this event because the questions we had are the ones that we asked. Uh, this is session three, supporting young people and the economy through world-class apprenticeships. It is sponsored by BAE Systems. And as I say, it's a conversation we recorded last week. Welcome back to the World Skills UK Live Online International Skills Summit. Now, this session is called Supporting Young People and the Economy Through World Class Apprenticeships. And I'm delighted to say that on our panel uh, for this session are Liz Pollard. Liz Pollard is Managing Director of Shared Services UK for BAE Systems, and indeed, BAE have sponsored this session. We have Angela Joyce, who's CEO of Warwickshire Cottage Group, and also Colin Hagen, who's Managing Director of River Park Training and Development and joins us from Belfast in Northern Ireland. Now, before we meet the panel in depth and also hear some of their views about um, the way forward in this remarkable time we're living in, we just want to show you a short film. Now, this is a film of BAE apprentices and um, you'll hear them and some of the team at BAE talk about why they are involved in World Skills UK competitions. <laughs> right at the beginning that this was the right thing to do, to be involved in competitions because we know how important competitions are in helping to improve and learn and benchmark against the very best. My World Skills UK training integrates really nicely into my main uh, apprenticeship programme simply because the training that I'm doing with World Skills UK is um, it's invested in my skills that I'm later going to use in the business. So people have a lot of time for you and they're very respectful of the fact that you need to take a little bit of time out of placement to uh, train. I've always been quite a competitive person, so <laughs> the chance to enter a competition, I jumped at it. And like I said, from watching previous previous year's competitors, watching the jobs that they were making, it looked quite good. Started up a, a World Skills UK council as well, uh, doing training for this year. We're using previous competitors that come and talk to us about their experiences. Going into competitions, my main feeling is more the anxiousness of having to compete. Uh, so I think speaking to previous competitors definitely helps settle any nerves that I have going into it. It's really important for us to be involved in World Skills UK competitions because we know that when our apprentices compete in that particular trade set, what they're doing is they're honing their skills, but they're also competing and we're able to benchmark where we are against that particular standard. It's nerve-wracking but also really exciting. I enjoy the competition side of it. Um, I feel like we've prepared well so um, yeah we'll just be looking forward to putting those skills to use and uh, representing the company. We're going to hear more from BAE Systems about how their apprenticeship model works and we're also going to discuss about so many other areas surrounding this session. But before we do, um, and just in a way to warm up the panel and so that they can, uh, you can get an idea at home of, uh, of where they stand in the world we are currently living in. Um, Liz Pollard, uh, Manager Director, Shared Services UK, BAE Systems, if I can just turn to you first and just ask you, um, how you feel the world we are seeing is changing at a remarkably speedy rate. How do you feel about the future? It's been interesting, actually. It's been interesting journey over the last few months. I'm sure all of us have felt that way in, in 
one way, shape or form. But I'm actually more encouraged now than I ever have been. I have a couple of kids at home who are uh, in year 10 and year seven. And just to watch how quickly they respond to what's going on around them and how, how much they're adapting and how um, they're willing to just really seize what they can and make the best out of the situation and go forward is actually making me really encouraged for what we're going to be seeing in the future. I think we all needed to hear something like that, didn't we? Thank you very much, Lee, for that, Liz. Um, Colin Hagen, Managing Director of River Park Training and Development in uh, Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, how, do, how do you feel currently? Obviously, still a part of the UK, but every different part of the UK is tackling coronavirus and, and the world that is surrounding us slightly differently. Uh, we've had to adapt. Like many other people have had to adapt. And our, our biggest challenge was probably to go off online. Uh, we had nothing available uh, at the end of March uh, commercially uh, for what we do, because we are predominantly motor vehicle in body repair and uh, refinishing. Uh, so it's a whole learning schedule about uh, using Google Classroom and every other interactive means that we could do to uh, to keep our guys focused and uh, maintain their, their skills that levels. So, Angela, if I if I can put that question to you, things are changing at a really speedy rate in the UK and indeed around the world. How are you feeling about the way forward? I think it's uh, certain that we can say the future is going to be different from the past, but I think we can say that at any time. Um, but I think, you know, uh, we enjoy change in the college sector. We've lived through change all the time. Um, it, the pace of things are changing more, uh, I think, you know, faster than ever before. Uh, but we're ready. We're ready for a future that's different from the past. Well, it's good to hear something about how you are perceiving um, the world around us generally. And of course, we will uh, take some questions at, at the end, which we already have, as as you know, this is a pre-recorded session, so please don't send them for this particular part of the uh, the two day event. Um, so, Liz, if I if I can return to you, we we saw um, a film there of BAE apprentices, and it's it's clear that they take it seriously. It's also clear that BAE systems take it seriously too. How how does your apprenticeship model work? I think apprentices is something that's near and dear to the heart of every BAE systems employee, and it's really been. Uh, interesting to see how um, when, when we when we entered into the beginning of the COVID um, pandemic and the changes that were required, it was really interesting to see how uh, it was absolutely of paramount importance to all of all of us in the management world within BA Systems that we didn't miss a beat with the apprenticeship programs and we didn't have our apprentices that were uh, put in situations where they were going to be um, inadvertently suffering because of it, it just makes it realize it's part of the DNA of the company. So BA Systems is a defense and aerospace and security company, and we do employ more than 34,000 people across the United Kingdom. And as you could see in the video, we develop and manufacture and maintain some of the world's most complex engineering products and services in land, air, sea, and in the cyber domains. And so the work demands high skill standards, which often reflects uh, international standards as well. And we have to exceed our customers' expectations and continue adapting to constant technological change. Apprenticeships are essential to meeting our current and future skills need, and in particular, addressing the STEM skills, STEM skills shortage that we see in the UK, such as nuclear engineering, systems engineering, project management, for example. High quality teaching enables us to meet uh, industry and professional body standards and to confirm competence in the suitable qualified experienced personnel status that's increasingly important in the defense sector. Our apprenticeship pipeline is also crucial as we build a diverse and inclusive company, which in turn makes us more productive and competitive. And one of the many advantages of the apprentices, apprenticeships is their flexibility to suit the learner. And we now offer over 50 different standards across the company. Over the last five years, there's been a clear growth in higher and degree apprenticeships, which now represent about a third of our annual intake. And as I mentioned, it's really core to the DNA of the organization. The requirement for apprenticeships is captured through a robust business planning process and ensures we match apprentice training output with the roles and skills that are required by the business. We validate the value of a program by measuring the return on the investment that we get from the apprenticeships. And each apprentice actually delivers a full return by the end of their first year in work after training. Despite the challenges I mentioned, the coronavirus uh, pandemic, where we're still recruiting a record number of apprentices this year, which will take us to over 2,300 in active training. And apprentices represent around 7% of our UK workforce, and we have a very high completion rate of about 93%. 
We have a dedicated in-house training team and invested over 50 million pounds in new training academies. And we're really committed to partnering with education providers, including some long-term partnerships with various colleges. We're proud that our investment in skills is reflected in the results achieved. And our apprenticeship program is rated as outstanding by Ofsted. And around half of our degree apprentices graduate with first class degrees, which we're really, really very happy with. We aim to provide an enriching and supportive experience for our learners. And whether that's through skills competitions, such as World Skills and the Apprenticeship Innovation Challenge, or our Bound or STEM ambassador activities and, and everything else. So World Skills, particularly World Skills competitions, really give our apprentices a chance to showcase their skills and strive to improve them, competing with and learning from really the best in the world. And we're proud of their accomplishment and the trainers who support them to these exceptional standards. And we do see a wider benefit when they bring their learning back into the business, which means we all we all win from it. At BA Systems, behaviors are important and participation in world skills competitions encourages and supports our apprentices to develop the right behaviors, which will support them through the competition and pro prove an excellent basis for the rest of their careers. With the new apprenticeship standards, our model has changed from traditional assessors to skills coaches who manage apprentice performance and development in a more agile and tailored manner while in providing comprehensive pastoral support throughout the program. Each apprentice has a dedicated skills coach from day one. They're uniquely placed to deliver a program of guided discovery covering behaviors, business skills, and applying academic knowledge. Alongside line managers, mentors, and peers, this gives our apprentices the very best start to their career. The pace of technolo technological change is faster than ever, and the digital transformation of Industry 4.0 has informed our investment in new academies and additional training for apprentices. And one or two of the academies were, uh, were highlighted in the video we just watched. Apprentices are encouraged to experiment and explore the potential of these technologies in a safe environment with access to collaborative robotics, intelligent workstations, 3D printing technologies, and digital twinning. BA Systems operates at a leading edge of technology, and it's vital that our apprentices learn, operate, and innovate in these environments. It provides us with a talent pipeline that we need, and it gives our apprentices the best start, as I mentioned earlier. In order to, matching, in order to match the game-changing technological advantage, we we've partnered with leaders in our sector, and we now design and deliver new industry standards. We resulted in 20 new apprenticeship standards covering key knowledge, skills, behaviors, and is transferable across the broader sector, not just for BA systems alone. The apprenticeship standards were developed in partnership with small and medium enterprises, and we ensure that they do meet the needs of companies throughout the supply chain and across the UK. We really feel that the industry needs to benefit and will benefit from this from top to bottom across the entire supply chain. As I mentioned earlier, the COVID-19 pandemic has created new challenges across society, and we are able to respond quickly and creatively to ensure there was no break in our apprentices' learning. It's a process which must continue if we're to guarantee the best experience for our learners, and we continue to learn, adapt, and leverage technology to remain resilient during uncertain times. Through our commitment to high standards of teaching and exceptional technical skills, we really are creating a workforce that's ready to meet tomorrow's challenges. Our future apprentices will have the digital and behavioral skills to respond with agility and innovation, ensuring the success of our company and of the UK PLC. World skills will remain an integral part of the development of our apprentices from a technical and behavioral perspective. We know our apprentices really value and enjoy the competition. It's definitely one of the highlights of their year and of our year. All right, many, many thanks for that. I think um, you certainly covered a lot of ground and we will probably return to some of that uh, during this session. And if you have just joined us, welcome. You're watching the World Skills UK Live Online International Skills Summit. And this event is about supporting young people and the economy through world class apprenticeships. Um, if we can move from BAE Systems to River Park Training and Development in Belfast in Northern Ireland, where we're joined by Colin Hagen. Colin, you're, you're Managing Director. Um, and I just wonder if, if we can start by just asking why you feel it's, it's, it's been worthwhile and important for you to have used World Skills UK competitions as part of the model for, for your apprenticeships. <clears throat> well, basically we've looked at uh, World Skills, I've been involved in World Skills since 2005. And, uh, <clears throat> A lot of our students we get coming uh, to us wouldn't be what we call academically uh, at the top of their game and most of them would probably be in the middle of the class and that's where they've been throughout their school year 
Uh, we do an induction at uh, the beginning, and one of the things that we do is we show them uh, World Skills UK and World Skills International skills competitions, and uh, also parade our our past medalists, uh, and then install that uh, uh, into them that uh, they can actually achieve this. And uh, I always say at every induction, uh, those of you who are sitting in front of me, that in two years' time, one of you will be coming up to me and asking me to, to be a skills competitor. And uh, they always do. So um, skills competitions is very, very important to us. Uh, it certainly gives them that hope to be something that probably they wouldn't have uh, throughout their school year. And it also gives us uh, a lot of things to benchmark from. Uh, even in the normal assessments, we, we take competition um, ideas and, and show them to other people. And when all these young people come and sit down and actually realise that their skills <coughs> are something that uh, they probably weren't really aware of and uh, how they actually can excel in life, it, uh, it certainly makes a difference with them there. And I wonder if I can ask you, obviously, when, when your, your apprentices take part in competition, there's, there's a number of stages, isn't it? First of all, it's thinking they can actually do it and achieve it, and then to work out the standard at which they have to perform. I mean, are you able to see a direct change in the apprentices that work for you as they head through that analysis of, yes, I can actually start the competition. Actually, I'm doing quite well. And seriously, I'm achieving it. How, how does how do you spot the change in their personalities over that time? Uh, you can see that with their commitment um, and their buy-in, because uh, really they don't really actually really understand that they actually have these skills. And uh, whenever you give them a task to do, and you actually show them, pat them on the back, or whatever way you want to congratulate them, and let them evaluate themselves, because evaluation of themselves is probably the most important. Uh, and then they can see themselves how they're actually starting to, to progress and then thinking, you know, actually, I could go forward, I could do this, I could do this, and I could be something. And everybody's scared of failure, um, but getting over that barrier and showing them that they, they actually have nothing to be scared of and they actually have got that and uh, just installing that into them is, is the main part. Angela Joyce, CEO of uh, Warwickshire College Group, can I ask you about your own college's view of apprenticeships and, and, and why they're important, not just obviously for the courses and the work that you deliver, but also for employers in the UK. Thank you. Um, apprenticeships, we know, are good for young people, they're good for businesses, but of course that relationship needs to work and it's the college's job to be the glue between the apprentice and the employer and of course to provide the specialist expert off the job training. Um, at WCG, at our group of colleges, we build relationships with the employers. We listen, we run organisational needs analysis, training needs analysis. We understand and then we respond. We work with over 1,100 employers uh, directly and train around 2,500 apprentices each year. And many of our employers return to us each year uh, to recruit another apprentice or sometimes perhaps less frequently, particularly if it's a, an SME. But we invest in our understanding also of our local economy and our regional economy. And in doing so, we offer a really wide range of apprenticeships from level two uh, through to level six. Most of our apprentices in our colleges are at level three and above uh, because those are the job roles that match uh, the vacancies the employers are trying to fill and so we're responding directly to the nature of the job role uh, that, that exists. Um, the apprenticeship standards and the endpoint assessments are working much better now. Uh, we're able now to advise employers very much about the off-the-job uh, element and the on-the-job training and we recognise that employers are making a huge investment by recruiting an apprentice and it is our job to see that that investment works for both the apprentice and for the employer. There is an ever-changing world. I mean, we spoke at the very beginning, we went through the panel and spoke at the beginning about how things are changing at such a such a fast rate. Uh, and I, I obviously, d depending on your age, you find it more easy or easier or more difficult to keep up with the pace of change. I think everyone probably is currently struggling. Are you seeing or potentially seeing apprentices who perhaps had a really clear idea of the industry they wanted to go into six months ago, now thinking, I'm seeing the world change around me. Uh, yeah, they are. Uh, the world is changing this uh, virtual uh, reality. Um, uh, it's a little bit of a problem because our students are predominantly uh, hands-on based uh, and learning through a virtual uh, portal doesn't really oh. suit them very well. 
Uh, but they do adapt, and uh, we have uh, introduced quite a lot of means to do that. Um, but I think we do need to get back into uh, into some kind of contact, even though it'll be at distance. Uh, and these guys are, are hands to eye. Uh, coordination is, is the critical thing with them. And that, unfortunately, can't be done uh, on virtual means. It was interesting hearing from uh, Liz a few moments ago from BAE Systems about how BAE themselves are adapting to COVID and the, the, certainly there are, in all of these things, there are opportunities to change and there are real disasters to, to have to try and avoid. And I, I wonder for the apprentices that are going through the, um, the, the, the River Park training and development in, in Belfast, how, how they are feeling because um, everyone has COVID that is going on in their world around. Uh, obviously the UK also has Brexit Northern Ireland has a very specific version of both of those things, being a devolved area that is treating uh, coronavirus in its own way and is also obviously having to tackle the question of um, carrying on trade and business between the mainland UK and also between Ireland itself. Um, how, how do you feel the pandemic has changed or is changing not only the needs of your apprentices, but also the needs of organisations and, and, and training um, uh, outlets like, like yours? Uh, well, certainly Brexit was a problem to start with, and the pandemic isn't much better. Uh, and the two of them coming together has uh, really had an impact uh, on the island. Uh, the Vols nations, uh, be it right or wrong, uh, do their own thing. Uh, but that also raises issues of when you're locked down, when you're not in lockdown, what you can do, what you can't do. And we've had students uh, here locally uh, where we had localised lockdowns uh, and uh, we're following them and they realise that why have you not attended today? And then they explain to me that, sorry, we're, our area is locked down by postcodes. So it just makes things difficult, but we're, we're just, just like everyone else, we just got to bear it and uh, just get through it. Angela Joyce, can I ask you about the current world that we're living in? Because one of the issues I think for many employers, and you hear this all the time whenever they've been interviewed, and you cannot help but feeling huge empathy for the plight that many of them are in, because it's not as if in some cases employers have reached a fork in the road. They've effectively been derailed. I mean, do you, have you seen any of their thinking has changed? And is that impacting on what you have to provide for the future now we have uh, this pandemic in the background or indeed in the foreground? Yeah, yes, definitely. I mean, apprenticeship recruitment has undoubtedly been affected by this um, pandemic. Um, and we're seeing many employers, understandably, delay in taking on an apprentice. From our perspective, I think we see the impact varies in different sectors. So for us around the engineering and manufacturing sector, it's uh, perhaps been less impacted so far than perhaps more customer facing roles, such as um, people recruiting apprentices in dental nursing or beauty therapy. So I think, you know, it, it is it is a very different environment and undoubtedly the opportunities uh, for young people to go to an apprenticeship at this very point um, has been hugely, uh, but as I say, understandably impacted by, by the current coronavirus. Because it's clear that many employers are having to make decisions not by the year, not by the month, but by the day, particularly, you know, as, as we speak, this is, viewers will know now, this is a pre-recorded session. And we, as a panel, found out two days ago that um, England was about to go into a, into a second lockdown. And one of, one of the issues, I suppose, is about planning. And planning is difficult enough for employers, but for um, students, for apprentices, for those who are just developing their thoughts about their careers going forward, and indeed for, for, for colleges like you, who are supplying that, um, fulfilling that need, that planning must be incredibly difficult for you. I can't lie, uh, you are correct. Um, in planning is very difficult. Um, our job is, of course, to be responsive, um, you know, and we are doing our best to be responsive to, um, you know, the, the needs of the economy, the needs of the apprentice, the needs of the employers that we work with, um, but also responding to government advice that is changing uh, around, around coronavirus and the mitigations we need to put in place. Um, we learned uh, back in March that we can shift quite quickly um, from a face-to-face -face world to a virtual world. Um, and I'm delighted to say that, you know, in our colleges, um, you know, staff, students, apprentices have worked tremendously well together to make that transition from 
uh, from face to face to virtual very successfully. Um, you know, and I guess we've learned, like lots of other organisations, uh, a lot about ourselves and what we can achieve when we really have to. Um, and I think, you know, uh, we're going to need to continue to respond in that way. Um, but in terms of planning long term, uh, we as colleges are the same as any other employer in that planning for the long term at the moment um, is more of a challenge than it's ever been before. All right, many thanks for that. And, and one of the things I, I, I think I probably should ask before we, we go any further, and we, we've almost touched on it in terms of the way that um, both of, of the, the, the double threats, if you like, that, that many organizations are having to overcome and dealing with it. Liz, if I, if I can go back to you, uh, Liz Pollard from BAE Systems, and, and just ask what assistance from outside do you now need? Or do you feel that you're relatively self-contained enough to be able to cope with the challenges. We've seen unprecedented levels of support that have come from central government to all kinds of businesses, SMEs and, 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 um, and, and, and world, worldwide businesses that, that are based in the UK. What about for BAE Systems? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's safe to say that, that um, we're not really new to this party. So we've been you know, investing heavily in our apprenticeship programs for quite some time. And because of that means we've built up some really good partnerships um, over a number of years. Um, and now because those partnerships are strong, we are, you know, we're able to draw on those partnerships and also hopefully contribute back and, uh, and therefore kind of keep things a bit seamless. Certainly we are, um, you know, we are looking to take part in some of the various government um, schemes that are being renounced, for example, the kickstart the pending bid approval, obviously, we'll be participating in the kickstart scheme and we're going to offer six month placements up to 30 young people who complete the movement to work um, with us. You know, we're going to be trialing the engineering T levels as those come on online and things like that. So, I mean, there's definitely ways that um, that we are trying to actively ensure that we're current with everything that's out there. Um, but being such a large organization that we are, and as I mentioned, having so many of our senior managers NBA systems come up through the apprenticeship route. Um, it, it, it's it's an easy it's an easy um, it's an easy sell. Let's put it that way within our organization to make sure that we don't take our eye off the ball where it comes to our apprenticeship programs. We have seen a number of weeks ago now Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, talking about build back better. We've heard the government, various ministers, talking about skills, apprentices, uh, and apprenticeships indeed, and 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 the way forward. Um, what is your vision? What is your view of, of the government's policy on um, not just obviously how it's dealing with coronavirus and, and COVID-19 in the wider UK, but specifically of how it's dealing with the needs and requirements of, uh, of industries and, and those uh, arriving in industries in, in terms of their role as, as apprentices going forward? Are, are they on the mark? Are they on the right track, do you think? Apprenticeships are and should be um, part of the planning for the future of UK PLC. Um, we know that apprenticeships are a good investment. They're a good investment for the apprentice, for the employer and for the government. Um, and I think government needs to maintain its focus on apprenticeships. Um, there are so many successful business people who I meet who started out as apprentices, um, but uh, I bet they don't have the cap and gown photograph above the mantelpiece of them receiving their apprenticeship award. Um, and we as a college group are striving very much to play our role in, in changing that um, so that apprenticeships are celebrated in the same way as somebody who's gone through a, a, the university system, uh, for instance. So I think the government is, uh, is challenging uh, the status quo, um, but it's perhaps uh, a little bit overdue uh, in challenging the divide between academic and technical. Uh, simple fact is we need both. Uh, the government is finally, it seems, recognising um, that we do need both and the government's attitude towards technical education is changing. Uh, the T-levels and the new apprenticeships um, are indicators, I think, that we're going to see the divide between academic and technical education shifting. Um, and as I say, um, I'm delighted it's here, albeit I suspect it's a little bit overdue. Um, one is not better than the other. Uh, both are equal. We need uh, individuals uh, with both academic and technical skills. Um, and schools, colleges, universities all have their different parts to play um, in training the future workforce and, and supporting UK PLC. 
Colin, uh, if I can answer the same thing f from you, Colin Hagen, yep. Managing Director, River Park Training and uh, Development in Belfast in Northern Ireland. If, if, if um, central national government are watching this or indeed local government in, in Northern Ireland or indeed um, even smaller sections of the, the way that administrative systems are, are now working that could offer you assistance, what do you need? What, what, what are you asking for? Well, what we've found is that uh, it's now takes a lot longer to do training. Uh, we have reduced class sizes down to six, obviously for safe distancing. Uh, our local government has in, uh, put in uh, grant schemes to help employers take on new uh, apprentices uh, and also to return apprentices from furlough uh, and complete their qualification at whatever level it is, level two or level three. Uh, and they certainly are very financially viable. And uh, a lot of employers we spoke to are very keen to proceed with them. Uh, their problem is that we work with the, the accident repair industry uh, due to the lack of uh, traffic uh, being reduced on the roads. Uh, accident rates have actually dropped by about 70% uh, over the summer months. So that puts a restriction on the actual work available uh, to these companies. Uh, that will probably pick up over the winter months uh, and we do to return back to some kind of normality. Uh, but it's getting the students back in there and getting them back in and working uh, is, is the main thing. Time is a, the biggest thing we would ask for for our local government. We've uh, spoke with our local um, contract managers uh, and asked them to, to change how we actually do things and uh, join in with this blended learning approach, which uh, we've adapted to and uh, it seems to be working so far. Wish you all the best with that. The number of questions uh, have, have come in and obviously in all these sessions, if you're watching this uh, at home or at your business or at your college, wherever indeed you're watching, you can by all means get in contact. This is a pre-recorded session, so the questions we're asking already we have. Um, and I wonder if I could start with this one from, uh, this is from Richard Marsh, who's Director of Apprenticeships at Kaplan Finance, who, who asked this question, why does the panel believe that skills competitions haven't been widely adopted as endpoint assessment methodology. Um, let me, if I can, start with, uh, with, uh, with Liz Pollard on that. Do you think there is, a, there is a query about, amongst some, about the value of competition? I say there's so much a, a, well, perhaps a query about the value of competition. I think that, I, I do think that there's, um, there's always that balance of, of what's in it, uh, what's the immediate business requirement right now and what's right for the long term of the business, but marrying that with what's right for the long term of the individual. And I think um, I think it's really important that, you know, we all remember that competitions, skills competitions are absolutely fundamentally critical to long term success uh, for, of the individual and of the organization. Um, but the question is, of course, if you have an immediate business need, and it, it, it appears that it takes away from that immediate business need, um, then, you know, you're juggling priorities as an organization. And certainly, you know, as, as we were just discussing, it is a challenging time for anybody. And it's been a challenging time for everybody, even, you know, pre-COVID, there's been some some challenges and some uncertainties in our world. So so I can understand that, that people might not necessarily see the immediate gain and therefore not realize long-term investment. I think it's beholden on all of us to make sure that we do celebrate the successes and make it very well aware of, of actually the immediate return. We clearly see in our apprentices, uh, we clearly see the immediate return and we can clearly see how they translate that back to their workplace, uh, both to their skills coaches, back to their managers, back in their work teams. You, you know, it really does pay dividends. Um, so and, and you can quantify that as well as just not just seeing it with your eyes. You can quantify it on a sheet that says actually, yeah, I, I can tell that there is a difference in output or in throughput or in, in, in success from those people who've actually taken part in competitions where they've had to compete and, and reach a benchmark against the rest of the world. I think when you look at it holistically as part of, a, as part of an overall package, then yes. I mean, there's a line item. It's obviously a little bit more challenging to quantify that as an individual line item. But when you look at it as an overall package and we start seeing things like, you know, 98% of our apprentices that complete programs go on to be full-time employees and all of them almost are still with us a year down the road. You know, the number of people getting these first draft degrees, the, the number of candidates that we have that are trying to join or like to join BA systems in the apprenticeship role because of because of the reputation we have, because of the positive work environment, the long-term career success of our apprentices as they go on and take on significant technical or managerial roles in the organization. I mean, all these points sort of join up to give you a very clear picture that a holistic rounded education during the apprenticeship is critical. And a big chunk of that is competing on the world stage. 
Liz Pollard, thank you very much Lee, for that. I'm Colin Hagen, Manager Director of River Park Training and Development in Belfast. Can I put the same, same question to you? Why does the panel believe that skills competitions haven't been widely adopted as endpoint assessment methodology? I think the difference is the competitor. Um, uh, some students uh, can work quite well and fit in with their work environment and they're quite comfortable in the work environment. Uh, but to use a competition as, a, as an endpoint assessment, uh, that's not really fair on those who actually don't want to be in competitions. Uh, competition is not for everybody. Uh, it's certainly, uh, we've had quite a lot of students who have been uh, very, very skilled uh, and I've approached them and asked them, would they want to enter a competition? Uh, and one person in particular actually turned around and said to me, he wouldn't do a competition uh, because he didn't like being second. So in that rate, it's a competition is for the competitor uh, and not, uh, not for everybody. That's a, that is actually a fascinating line. And I think it's one of the first things you have to learn when you're competing in anything, isn't it? Whether you're an Olympian or whether you are in business or, or, or whatever, indeed, even if you're at a casino making a bet, you have to, you have to learn that skill of being accepting mm -hmm. that you've done your best and you haven't necessarily reached the top position because it's a journey. Do you think that's something you can teach, Colin? Uh, I think to a certain extent, uh, and that's a little bit of uh, instilling belief into people, uh, because sometimes there may be that inner competitor is in there. Uh, you can teach skills um, to most of the most of our students. We can develop skills. Uh, the competitor is a, a, a different person. The competitor is a person who can take the knocks, uh, fall back, and get back up again. Uh, and some people just can't accept that. Whenever they get a knock, they just want to. That's, that's, that's my limit, that's where I'm going, and that's I'm not going any further. The competitor is the one that stands up, that keeps repeatedly coming back and come back and back and more. So if I could put that same question to, uh, to, to you, to, uh, to Angela Joyce, CEO of Warwickshire College Group. The question came from Richard Marsh, Director of Apprenticeships at Kaplan Finance. And this, this, is, this is what he asked. Why does the panel believe that skills competitions haven't been widely adopted as endpoint assessment methodology? Um, do, do you think there is a, a question that people have about the importance of competition? I think uh, there's always that question on competition, and I think the question is probably based uh, on understanding. I think for those of us that understand competition um, and the you know important role that competition um, can uh, can play um, in an apprentice's journey. Um, you know, I think if we understand that, then you can make the link between how a competition can be used as part of an endpoint assessment. Um, and I think World Steels UK is doing a fantastic job in developing that insight and that understanding into what competitions really are um, and how they can impact on apprentices. Um, we saw in the video from BAE Systems, from heard from some apprentices there who were talking, you know, very clearly. Um, about how they saw the competition linking and developing them as apprentices. So I think um, I think that you know I certainly hope that that comes um, that the competition element you know is seen more and more about you know how we make our apprentice uh, apprenticeship programs um, world class um, and, and that's what World Skills UK can do. So I think it's about understanding. Um, and I'm sure there's more change to come and they'll be used more and more widely as, as time goes on. And just to extend that theme, you've seen presumably a link between those apprentices who have gone through competition, who have seen the success of, of other countries when they compete around the world and are, are able to not just, just, just think about matching their success, but also just reaching and getting that uh, getting that benchmark that they can bring back home with them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, I think the impact on those uh, individuals is is tremendous. Um, you know, it's, it's good for them and their own development. It's good for their employees. It's good for the country um, to be, you know, involved in these competitions and, and, and seeing the celebration. Um, you know, it's 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 an incredibly pressured environment. Uh, you know, the, the World Skills UK competitions and what these apprentices are doing. Um, you know, and and they are doing it. You know, wholeheartedly uh, with huge success. Um, and you know, I uh, 
I'm, I'm still waiting for the day that, uh, like our Olympic team, who rightly um, are toured around uh, London in open top buses and celebrated and are on the news uh, all of the time when they bring home medals. I'm, I'm waiting to see our, our World Skills uh, Team UK uh, when they come back from a World Skills competition being celebrated in exactly the same way. I think that would be uh, that that would be a real marker for the country and really help the apprenticeship program. Just before we, we we go on to some more questions, Liz, can I can I ask you? It's a slightly personal question, but I just wonder whether you have some um, direct empathy with this with this idea that there there are people, and I think we've probably all felt this in whatever form of our work or or, or our play. That yeah, do we? It's almost like do we run for that train because we might miss it, and then we'll feel really idiotic for having attempted it. There there is that human feeling, isn't there? So what we do try to do at MBA Systems is encourage in our own internal training centers, we encourage, we, we encourage a whole lot of programs, be it um, you know minor, quite small internal competitions to larger scale internal competitions as a bit of a proving ground. So people have a safe environment where they can develop and, and think creatively and come up with new solutions. And there's a number of examples of, of items that have been created uh, and solutions that have been solved by our apprentices in these environments that then go back and make it onto our products and become you know, proper technical solutions that were used. So we do have a lot of internal wins. So I think it's really important that we give people the opportunity to develop those skills in sort of bite-sized increments uh, increasing. So by the time they get to the point in their careers where it really does matter, they, they pull in that skill. Okay, let's move on. Thank you, Rajni, for that. This is from D. Elliott Smith, who is Head of National Competition and Careers at WorldSkills UK, uh, and asked this of the panel, what more can we all do to boost the prestige of apprenticeships amongst young people and also encourage enrolments from diverse backgrounds? Maybe we can start this time um, with Colin Hagen, Managing Director of River Park Training and Development over in, uh, in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Colin, what, what more do you think can be done? Well, I think it's, uh, it starts from schools. Uh, it needs to be uh, installed with the careers advisors in the schools. Uh, a lot we've brought a lot of careers advisors into us uh, and uh, shown them around the training centre and whatever, and we've done a lot of school visits. And it's only when you actually talk to teachers directly uh, that they actually understand that uh, the skills actually are of value uh, and sometimes more than, than academic. Uh, but a school is designed to push academic uh, no matter what. Uh, and it's very hard to get across their buyers. I think Germany is one of our best uh, neighbours, which actually looks at things differently, uh, where an engineer, for example, is at the, the same level as a doctor. And it's interesting that there certainly was, uh, and, and probably still is, but, but, but when you looked at the media and you looked at the news and you looked at the way the early stages of this pandemic was being covered here in the UK, there was certainly a sudden amazement from people of the importance of skills, because suddenly, the skills that perhaps we all began to take for granted in this country uh, for no possible ill reason, just because that's the nature of, of, of how we are, suddenly became really important. So perhaps people, do you think people are already seeing things slightly differently? Uh, yes, I think they are. <coughs> I think um, uh, the, the focus has been, uh, we've looked at the, our health service, for example, uh, and we stood and watched crowds out in the street, uh, certainly giving them claps and applause. and. Uh, with our delivery drivers and certainly the focus has now switched from that high academic person with a degree to the person who's actually delivering your parcel. So if I could put that question to you Angela, Angela Joyce is CEO of Warwickshire College Group um, and just a reminder of the question, D. Elliott Smith who's Head of National Competition and Careers at, uh, at WorldSkills UK uh, asks what more can we all do to boost the prestige of, of apprenticeships among young people and encourage enrolments from diverse backgrounds? It's a good question and I think uh, we all have a role to, uh, we all have a role to play. Um, I mentioned previously, you know, we're doing our part as an organisation to try to um, celebrate apprenticeships in the same way as, um, you know, as students, you know, going through uh, university may be. Um, and we hold apprenticeship graduations uh, so that our apprentices, their employers and their families all get together and we hold a graduation. Um, and I really hope that those photographs of those apprentices receiving their award sit on the mantelpiece um, and are there and celebrated um, as the part of that person's journey. So I think any profile raising activity such as that um, is really, really important um, to do it. I think, you know, apprenticeships need to be 
a part of um, you know a part of everybody's conversation, part of uh, everyday dialogue, um, you know, and, and celebrating the fact that you know a lot of these apprentices, you know, they're holding down a job with training, with college study, um, and have perhaps you know a whole lot more uh, to celebrate and be proud of than perhaps a student who's in full time in full time study. Uh, so I think anything we can do to put apprentices first and foremost and celebrate the fact that these apprentices have uh, achieved a lot more, perhaps at the age of 16, 17, 21, whatever it is, uh, by, by getting their apprenticeship uh, placement, um, you know, it, it, it has got to be good for all of us. But I think all of us, you know, um, you know, schools, colleges, universities, the government, employers, we all need to raise the profile of apprenticeships and in some instances, perhaps myth bust and help people to understand what an apprenticeship really is and, and how superb our apprentices really are. Many thanks for that. And I wonder if I can ask the same question um, to, to you, Liz. Um, and, and just a reminder, this is, this is a question. Uh, what more can we all do to boost the prestige of apprenticeships amongst young people and encourage enrolments from diverse backgrounds? Yeah, no, I think well, I, I, you know, just uh, to copy on what Colin said, because I agree with, with what he said about early in the schools, but definitely. I think the other avenues that we need to, we need to investigate all other avenues to really encourage people to, to participate. So for example, you know, we spend about 150,000 in movement to work um, uh, last each year. And 80% of those people who came through the movement to work um, joined us on training or apprenticeships, um, which is fantastic, right? It's another avenue in that's it's a great avenue. Uh, we have a long way to go, if we're really honest, when we look at the diverseness of our, our diversity in our workforce. Um, you know, we only had 24%, I think it was last year, of, of women, and um, and only 5% of our apprentices were from from um, Black or minority ethnic backgrounds. So there's definitely a room for us to go there. So I think what's important is for us to increase, to continue increasing the type and the variety of the training that we offer to try to encourage the people with diverse thought and diverse backgrounds. So taking our apprentices as we've done from sort of 25 up to 50, 50 different programs really does encourage that diversity. And then setting them up to succeed and encouraging and therefore um, uh, displaying success and uh, advertising success internally and, uh, and, and you know, encouraging things like world skills and things like that, I think are really critical to raise the profile for sure. But definitely cast a wide net. Just... Yeah. Sorry, go on, finish your, no, finish no, no, your thought. I, no, no, please. I was just okay. gonna say, I was just, one head. thing I wanted, <laughs> one thing I wanted to say with the delay down the line now. <laughs> <laughs> one one thing I wanted to ask you was just just this this word prestige, which I thought was very interesting in the question because uh, I was lucky enough to um, head to Kazan in whenever it was. The world has taken so long. Was it 2018 or 20, 2019? So it was only last. It's only two summers ago, but it seems like ten years ago with the amount of things that have happened. But what I was 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 most surprised about is the the sheer extent of competition, the, the the sheer scale of worldwide competition, and I was doing my best to explain this to colleagues, to friends about what I was seeing and, and actually the difference that it makes. And, and there, is a, there is a skill about explaining the prestige of competition to people who understand GCSEs, they understand A-levels, they understand degrees, they may even understand BTECs, but they might not understand the complexities and the prestige of, of, of worldwide competition, you know, with 60, 70, 80 countries taking part, with it take, being taken very, very seriously by prime ministers, presidents, the, 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 the top of the country. Yeah. I just wondered what, what, what you thought of the, the, the simplest ways of explaining that prestige. Yeah, no, it's a good, that is a good question. You know, internally, I think internally we, we, we are able to do that, um, which has a, a lock on effect. So we have um, apprentices that go on to these programs. So for example, we had Abigail Stansfield who was selected to go to the Euro Skills in Graz in 2021, which has obviously unfortunately been um, postponed now. Uh, but when that was the case, uh, she got wide publicity on our employee-wide um, media app. So we do all of our employee communications come through the app. So she is widely publicized. So that hits our 32,000 employees. Those 32,000 employees hit their whatever, 40,000, 50,000 kids, that becomes a word of mouth. You know, it's very much a, a, a hit them often, hit them hard and make sure that it's well publicized internal. And then obviously when she come back, we would have had a, you know, follow up stories and all that. So, so uh, I think, I think targeting the targeting uh, communications in a very broad manner 
in a deep manner in the locations in which, which, within which we hope to recruit our pool of apprentices will go a long way to continue that pipeline. And also, you know, within the industries locally and therefore um, uh, uh, raising the profile of the whole thing. And Angela, if I can go back to you on this point as well, because one of the one of the key words in I thought thought one of the key words in that question was the word prestige. And you spoke earlier about the idea of um, treating those who come back from competition much like they do uh, the Olympians and also speaking about make sure that those awards are on the mantelpiece, just like they would be um, when you've taken a degree. Where do you think that needs to be led from? Is it because there'll be senior people in government watching this, there'll be those in in Her Majesty's opposition watching this, who needs to lead and how does that need to, to, to fulfil itself to get that prestige higher? I think it, it does need political drive, it does need government support um, uh, and I think the media as well, I think the media has got an important role to play here to create that, to create that prestige. Um, so I think, you know, it, 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 is, it, is, it has to be a top down and a bottom up approach um you know and i think uh, you know i think between that kind of top down and bottom up you know we can create the prestige but but ultimately yeah i think you know i think it's about uh, making sure the word uh, apprenticeship um you know is 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 spoken about by the most senior government officials and ministers um that that there are and they and it becomes part of that kind of prestige um you know as, as colleges we quite often see uh, for instance, that the, the media and, and politicians will talk about schools and universities and forget to mention uh, us colleges who are out there doing a fantastic job. And I think the same can be true of uh, apprenticeships. You know, we hear about A-levels and degrees, uh, but but do we hear apprenticeships in the same sentence? So I, th I think I think from the top down, you know, that that language perhaps needs to change. Um, you know, but but at the same time, you know, it's a case of all of us, you know, the, the likes of my organisation and others doing our role to kind of keep to keep locally and regionally changing perceptions and, and, and to heighten that prestige. Um, you know, an, an apprentice uh, and an apprenticeship is an amazing way to start a career. Um, and, and lots of people have done that. Um, and so perhaps more and more role models of those people will be will be helpful on a localised level as well. And Colin, if I could put that same question to you, this word prestige to try and explain to those who maybe don't understand the, the process of worldwide benchmarking competitions and the seriousness with which it is certainly embraced in, in many countries around the world, how you explain that to those who might, as I was saying, who might understand GCSEs, A-levels and degrees, or maybe even b six, but might not understand the, the worldwide competition. I personally think it's been very much undersold um, and it has been for a long, long time. It's really hard to get uh, a good news uh, item out there, uh, especially into the wider media and the television or whatever. Uh, bad news is always sells a lot better, uh, unfortunately. And uh, I remember back in 2013, uh, we actually hosted World Skills in London uh, and that wasn't televised at all. And our Prime Minister at the time gave a courtesy visit. Uh, of what we see in Russia, uh, where it's uh, an absolutely magnificent occasion, which is broadcast across the nation. And I just think it's, a, it's our media is, the, is the, the ones we need to, to grab and shake the leg by and uh, say, look, you know, we need to be selling this a little bit uh, higher uh, to make it more appealing uh, to a lot more people. Can I thank you all for joining us for, for this session to Liz Pollard, Managing Director of Shared Services UK, uh, for BAE Systems, to Angela Joyce, who's CEO of Warwickshire College Group, and also to Colin Hagen, Managing Director of River Park Training and Development uh, in Belfast in Northern Ireland, supporting young people and the economy through world-class apprenticeships, part of WorldSkills UK Live Online International Skills Summit. Thank you to you all and thank you for watching. And this is day one of the very first World Skills UK live online International Skills Summit. Many thanks, as I say, to our panellists in the previous session, which was sponsored by BAE Systems, uh, to Liz Pollard, to Colin Hagen and to Angela Joyce. And as if 
to demonstrate how quickly the world has moved on. We recorded that last week. Since we recorded that, we have a new president-elect in the United States and we have a possible vaccine which is going to possibly come on stream. There's a lot of possibilities when it comes to the vaccine in Christmas or the early part of the new year for some people. So the world, as we have always been saying throughout today, and no doubt we'll concentrate on it today and tomorrow, is moving at breakneck speed, whether we like it or not. Uh, now, coming up, we have our fourth session of the summit, our fourth session of today. Uh, it's developing digital skills to boost international investment. We spoke briefly about that to Gillian Keegan earlier on, where she was making her keynote speech earlier in the day, we're going to be joined by Josie Kluwer, who's partner, People Advisory Services, Government and Public Sector. Also by Philip Mueller, who's Education Manager at Autodesk. And Michael Maguire, who's a lecturer in Computer-Aided Architectural Design and Technology at New College in Lanarkshire. And we'll also hear from Emma Roberts, who is Head of Research and Public Affairs at WorldSkills UK, who was, about, who was uh, influential in creating the report about which we're going to speak about soon. So we will see you in about five minutes. See you soon.